Our next speaker is uh, Graeme Creed. I don't know whether Graeme needs any introduction. I certainly see him most weeknights after the news telling us about the weather. But to give you a bit of background you might not know about Graeme. Graeme has worked in New South Wales for 11 years in Moree, Wagga Wagga, Lord Howe Island as a bomb technical officer. He has also worked in television and radio for seven years with Ozstar and Foxtel and is currently ABC New South Wales and the ABC News Channel. Graeme also has a farm where he's building an enterprise with bees, native seeds, fruits, berries and garlic. So that's a great thing. Graeme's also a farmer. I bet you he's watching out for that next front as well. <laughs> and so um, he's got a great topic this morning and I think we can all relate to it and it's called, Where's the Rain You Promised? Hey Graeme, is that really your topic mate? Or is that a question that just keeps on ringing in your ears? Yeah, Albert, thanks for that. It does ring in my ears quite often sometimes. But uh, really today what I'd like to do with you is to share some of the tools that I use to create the forecast that we provide on television and radio right across the state and actually on uh, 24 News nationally as well. And I think that when you get a little bit of an understanding of what goes into some of these forecasts, some of the information that's available out there, You'll be able to look at the forecasts with slightly different eyes and hopefully more accurate eyes because quite often when we do look at a forecast and we read it, we take our own interpretation into that and sometimes it's that interpretation that is a little bit less accurate than what the actual forecast is. So looking at the um, rainfall to begin with. So rainfall is forecast by computer models. So basically these computer models are looking at the amount of moisture available through the atmosphere. Also how much stability or instability is sitting through it as well. And this is what they then decide who's going to see rainfall and how much rainfall is going to be expected from that. And that's how we get our little forecast with our percentage chance of rain and the probable rainfall. So this is basically uh, a model forecast and it has forecaster, so a human input into it. Now basically this is probably one of the most misread forecasts that the Bureau of Meteorology produce. So there are three things that I want you to walk away with on this graphic. That's 0.2 of a millimetre. 50% chance and 25% chance. So down at the bottom, chance of any rain, 100% on this forecast. Now that 100% relates to recording 0.2 of a millimetre of rainfall, because that's all that's recorded to class a day as having recorded rain. So you need to remember that it's not 100% chance between four and 10 millimetres. Now the other two figures that I mentioned were 50% and 25%. So in this example, there's a 50% chance that this location could record four millimetres of rain. And the 10 millimetres, there's a 25% chance that you may record 10 millimetres of rain. So most people look at this and think it's 100% chance of between four and 10 millimetres. Well, it's just not the case. So you need to look at these forecasts, remembering those key amounts or key figures. So the chance of rainfall, is just that you're going to get some drops. The rest of it is a 50% chance, always the figure on the left, just a 25% chance of the higher figure on the right. Now, as well as this, it's also worthwhile looking at some of the reasons or some of the causes of the rainfall that you're going to get. So not only do you need to read the text side of the forecast, but you need to work out or need to look at the potential of whether it's going to fall in showers and thunderstorms or is it going to be more widespread rain and this does make a difference because convective showers and thunderstorms are basically formed by updrafts and downdrafts and where you've got an updraft that's where you see the cloud forming because it's unstable but where you get a downdraft that's a very stable parcel of air and that's why when you see showers and thunderstorms there are usually big gaps in between them and that's why showers and thunderstorms any rainfall from them is going to be quite patchy 
The other feature is that forecast models can't predict exactly where these showers are going to form. That's an impossibility because it really does just depend on the heating during the day. So that's why we can't say that these showers will form at this specific location. The opposite can be said for stratiform clouds, so outer stratus in this example. Now basically these clouds are formed by uplift and that's triggering more broad rain falling across the region. So the benefit of getting it falling as rain rather than showers and thunderstorms is that most areas will record some. Not only that, the rainfall potential, so the 25 and the 50% chance of rain is highly likely. So we're not looking at patchy showers and storms, really hit and miss. Broad areas of a district will record rainfall. So it's worthwhile remembering that when you are looking at the day-to-day -day forecasts. Now, another tool that gives you a little bit more insight into rainfall is the eight-day rain forecast. Now, basically, this is a tool that uses eight separate forecast models. Now, the benefit of that is that you're looking at variations between each of the models. So this product actually combines all that information, gives you the best likelihood of rainfall across a region. And for the first five days of this forecast period, it's actually more, um, more accurate than any individual forecast model. So you're getting a far more accurate product than looking at just one model or one app. Now, the other thing about apps is most apps only use one of the forecast models. So this one is far more accurate than any individual map will be, and that includes the, the Bureau of Meteorology app and also the METI app, which are only using the Bureau's access model. Now, the other benefit with this is you get a really good national overview. You can go through it day by day, or you can choose to accumulate four day period. So the first four days and then the next four days. But not only that, you can bring it down into a state based view and you can also take it down into a district view if you wanted to go that low. Now there's also a different range of ways you can look at it. There's daily rainfall total for the nation, the state and the districts. These go out for individual days out to five days. There's a daily percentage chance of rainfall. We've got, as I said before, the first four days and then the next four days, the full eight days. But there's also an opportunity to go in and look at the percentage chance of one millimeter, five millimeters, 10 millimeters, 15, 25, and 50. And these give you a pretty good idea of exactly where this rain is expected to fall, what the chances of it are. And often when you see it written in a forecast, it may say there's a 50% chance of zero to five millimeters. When you come and drill down into this, it actually brings a, a much broader picture to where you can expect to see that rain and how likely it really is to fall. Now, one of the other benefits is that it, it really does give you that great overview and that percentage chance it really does become a lot clearer when you're looking at where this rainfall is coming over a period of multiple days. Now let's go from more short-term forecasts into a much broader climate outlook. Now we'll just say before I go through these charts, the ones that you're going to see coming up are older charts. I do have the current forecast charts or the current outlook charts coming up towards the end. Now the first difference here between a rain forecast and the climate outlook is that we're looking at totally different models. They're using totally different ways to look at what the climate's doing. And so you can't say that if the forecasts aren't right, then how can the outlooks be correct? Because we're, we're talking totally different systems and setups. It's also important to clarify that this is an outlook, it's not a forecast. No one can forecast rainfall that far out. So it is providing an outlook on the expected climate conditions that will produce a potential of rainfall. Now to start with, we can go to the overview page. So this is really quite a, a broad overview of what's going on through the atmosphere. Usually when you um, go into the summary section, 
it's talking state-based, e even multiple states. So at the moment, you know, it's, it's talking about potential of increased rainfall along the east coast, you know, potentially drier conditions over the inland. So it's really quite broad, which is not necessarily localised enough for individual farmers' needs. But what it also does on the Outlook page has climate influences. Now, what this will do is break down what are the main climate factors that are influencing the outlook for rainfall and temperature across the nation, across the state and down into the districts. And we also have the Outlook video, which is the Bureau's, Bureau's overview. And uh, that's a really good summary of the expected conditions. Let's go a little bit closer into these charts and we start off with a national overview. So the brown is lack of rainfall and the blue is the potential of median or above median rainfall. Look across the top there, we can do one week, we can look at two week outlook, a one month outlook and of course the three month or seasonal outlook. So there are different options there. You can look closer to home uh, in a shorter time period, or you can move further out. Now, the other aspect with this is that you can zoom in to New South Wales, or you can zoom in to the local region. And then again, you can still use, you can look at what the expectations are for the coming week, what the expectations are for the next two weeks, the next month, and then the next three month outlook. So it gives you a broad picture of what's going on through the atmosphere with regard to maximum temperature, minimum temperature, or what we're looking at here, believe it or not, is rainfall. So uh, in July has certainly started off dry. Hopefully it's going to end off a little bit on the wetter side and particularly for New South Wales, it's certainly looking that case, particularly for the coastal areas. Now, once you zoom in, you can also start playing with some of the boxes at the left hand side. So you can look at the chance of above median rainfall or below median rainfall. We've got different outlook scenarios as well. There's the chance of at least. So you can put in, what's the chance of 50 millimeters? And it'll give you a, a percentage chance of above or below those falls. And that actually ex uh, extends from one millimeter to 700 millimeters. So there's really quite a, a broad area there that you can look at. If you, if you would prefer to find out how much rainfall you're likely to record, then that tool is really quite valuable. Now it's worth noting that the, the median rain period in these uh, outlooks sits from 1990 to 2012. So it's not all records, but it is still um, very much a, a, a very accurate tool for rainfall in the coming months. Now there's also past accuracy down in the bottom left hand corner. Now I, I think this is one of the key things for myself using Bureau of Meteorology information is that it is basically all checked. So all the forecasts, all the outlooks, everything gets looked at to see whether it came around, whether or not it was accurate. And when you go to past accuracy, it will tell you and you'll be able to see that at certain times of the year, the outlook models are less accurate for certain areas. And this is typically because it's when the key drivers are in a change mode. So for New South Wales really is autumn, that is the, the least reliable period for rainfall, which is probably what we've seen with the, the outlooks over the um, recent month. Now, if you want all that information a little bit closer to home, I hope you can read that little box, but basically you can drag the mouse to where you think you're located and pick up almost localized farm-based information. Now in this instance, it's looking at the chance of at least 50 millimeters at Mangula. Now the median there is 40 millimeters, so 50 millimeters would be above median. The chance of above median is unlikely, but on top of that, it also tells you the percentage chance of up to 100 millimeters of rainfall. So it's some really quite localized information. And you can also get that with temperature maximums and minimums. So there's even this option to bring in those uh, outlooks into a, a very localized region. Now, one of the key things with using seasonal outlooks is that 
I really think that you need to get a little bit of an understanding on what the key drivers of the climate are, because it helps you understand when you read the notes and the summary notes, what is actually being spoken of. So for New South Wales, there are really four key drivers of climate, particularly for the hunter. El Nino La Nina, Indian Ocean Dipole, Southern Annular Mode, and also the Madden Julian Oscillation. Now these are all impacting rainfall and temperature across New South Wales at different times of the year. So let's look at some of the individual information on each of those things. Now, fortunately, the Bureau of Meteorology have recently created a new page called Climate Driver. So it basically sets out what the forecast models are saying is going to occur for the Pacific Ocean, the Indian Ocean, the Southern Ocean, and the tropics. So that's those four key indicators in the climate. The Madden-Julian Madden -Julian Oscillation is the tropics, Southern Annular Mode is the Southern Ocean, Indian Ocean is the Indian Ocean Dipole, Dipole and the Pacific Ocean is the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So let's go through them. Most of us have heard El Nino Southern Oscillation Index and La Nina. Now basically it's related to the movement of warm water. When we have the warm waters sitting in the Western Pacific, so that's along our East Coast, that typically leads to increased rainfall. When it sits over off the Eastern Pacific, so South America, we typically have cooler waters, so that means less rainfall. And then the Indian Ocean Dipole is basically that same system, but it sits in the Indian Ocean. It's the movement of warm waters from off the coast of Africa through to the coast of Australia. Again, when we had the warm waters off the West Coast, we're seeing above average or typically would lead to above average rainfall. When we get the cooler waters, like we experienced last year, then we see less rainfall. Now the Madden-Julian Oscillation, this is a, a tropical system it's basically a wave of instability that moves off the African continent. It traverses the equator and as it moves through or moves towards us, it increases the instability through the atmosphere. Now what that does is it can lead to increased monsoonal activity, tropical cyclones, and some of that moisture can be brought down into New South Wales and it can bring the potential of some widespread heavy rainfall. The Southern Annular Mode is basically an interaction of winds between the upper atmosphere and the lower parts of the stratosphere. And basically what this does is it means that cold fronts will either be closer to the mainland or they'll be further south from the mainland. Again, that's affecting the amount of moisture that we see from these cold fronts. In years where they're less active, we typically see less rainfall. Now added to the climate outlooks is climate change. You know, temperatures have increased over a degree across Australia, so that's in the atmosphere and also in the oceans. So that is already incorporated into the climate outlook models. It is worth noting, this is the, the Hunter region. These are the projected changes. So increasing temperatures, increasing fire dangers, decreasing snowfall about the higher parts, decreasing winter rainfall, increasing in autumn though through some areas and staying pretty much the same through spring and summer potentially and also generally increasing temperatures right across the region. So this is all incorporated into those climate outlooks. So let's have a, a closer look now at what the current climate outlooks are showing because there have been some quite big changes over the recent months. So this is for the week the 13th to the 19th of July. Now everyone's been talking about this east coast low forming and so we are starting to see the outlook models beginning to pick up the potential of that rainfall. Now at this stage they're suggesting that the low is going to be sitting up around the north coast because that'll probably be the area to see the heaviest of the falls. But if we go through and look at one month, so again for August the potential of above average rainfall. Now this is a combination of the warming waters in the Pacific Ocean and also warming waters in the Indian Ocean. So we are looking at the potential of increasing rainfall across the state. Because we're seeing it 
potentially a little bit higher through the inland areas, the input from the Indian Ocean dipole is likely to be slightly higher, but we are expecting to see the potential of that rainfall continue. Now, August is going to be the transition month. Well, Ju July really should be. Once we see this pattern change into wetter conditions, we really should start to see it then kick in and persist across the region. Now this chart, so this is the current one that was issued yesterday. This is the three month outlook from August through to October. Now it's actually looking at the percentage chance of 150 millimeters falling over that three month period. So for much of the hunter, that is a 50% or higher chance. So there is really quite a, a good potential of some worthwhile rainfall across the region over that three month period. Again, due to the Indian Ocean Dipole and also the ENSO, so the El Nino Southern Oscillation Index. And one of the key components to forecasting rainfall is forecast models. Now I took these yesterday. These are four specific models. So the Bureau's Access G, the European model, the American model, and a Canadian model. Now, hopefully you can see quite clearly, this is the forecast for Monday with the low pressure system positioned between the south coast and the far north coast. So when we talk about variability or variation between the forecast models, so a little bit of uncertainty in the forecast, this tells you why, because they're all saying something slightly different. And it is still four days out. So what we will see with these forecast models is that as each day progresses and the event gets closer, these systems will start to form in a much smaller area. So we'll start to see one area really stand out as the region most likely to record the heaviest of the rainfall. So by around about Sunday, that should be quite um, noticeable. And we, at that point, probably start to see some warnings being issued for this event. But I suppose the key from this, there is a lot of variability at times between forecast models. So the uncertainty in the rain forecast also coincides with that. So there will be quite a bit of change in the amount of rainfall in the forecast over the next day or two until all these models begin to come together. So hopefully that gives you a, a really good it is a very broad overview, but I really hope that one of the key things you perhaps take away from this is not only should we read the climate outlooks or read the forecast, but it really is worthwhile to get a little bit more understanding about the systems that are driving that rainfall or driving the hot temperatures because they're gonna repeat over time. So you start to build up a, a really good knowledge of how the weather systems work and on top of that, you can then add into, your, add into it your own innate knowledge of what's going on and what weather systems favor your area for perhaps rainfall or drier conditions. You can add that into the forecast information that comes to you from the Bureau of Meteorology. So hopefully you've, you've learned a little bit from that. Um, I have got my email address here. I am more than happy to answer questions if you want to send them through or provide you links, there will be links to all the, the key climate pages in the uh, digital copy that will be sent to you at the end of the, the forum. So uh, you will get all that information, but no, more than happy to answer some questions. I won't get straight back to you, but I will eventually get back to you. But uh, speaking of questions, I'll um, throw back to Albert and um, hopefully we can answer them. Mm -hmm.